Hello, everybody. I hope you're having a great day at GameCon at the Ann Arbor District Library. My name's Christopher, and we've got the last panel discussion of the day on world building. I'm really excited about the topic, and we've got some wonderful guests here. We have Kevin Zambida, we have Jim Hall, and Avery Alder. I'm going to let them introduce themselves and tell you a little bit about their games, and then we'll uh, have some questions. Okay, please help me welcome them. So if you just talk a little bit about uh, some of the games you've made and if you have any kind of world building idea uh, because it's such a huge topic and you may have a subconscious idea of what you look for in some of the worlds that you build for your games. Okay, thank you. Sure. Um, well, I'm Kevin Simbita. Uh, I've, uh, I'm the founder and publisher and chief game designer at Palladium Books. We've been doing role-playing games for 43 years. Uh, we've done Ninja Turtles, Robotech, Rifts is our, uh, one of our biggest games. You name it, we do it. Uh, we have one basic game system, so if you learn one of our games, you can play all of our games, and you know they're cross-compatible, so it, it's pretty fun. Um, and uh, yeah, I've, I've designed lots of different worlds, uh, and to the point where I actually had uh, um, Blizzard flew me in in 2010 to talk to their team about world building. That was fun. <laughs> um, so that that's who I am, Jim. Uh, I'm Jim Hall. I uh, run and I'm the main contributor of a little game company called Brooklet Games. We're based right out here, uh, right from Ann Arbor. And nice. uh, uh, over the past uh, four or five years, I've, I've put out a bunch of little adventure modules um, and actually just recently kickstarted uh, my first like system. So, um, and I think in terms of like world building, um, I, I pull from just uh, my, my interest, my fascination really with, with nature and the natural world and the, the little bitty critters that, that exist there. So, um, yeah, I don't know. You, you, you make what you, what you know. <laughs> yeah. uh, my name is Avery Alder. I've been designing and self-publishing games since uh, 2006. A lot of my games explore uh, communities and relationships. Uh, I have designed multiple games that are set kind of during the collapse of civilization or in a post-apocalyptic setting. And so that's um, both a setting that I find really fascinating to explore and also one that I think uh, gives us interesting tools to talk about our present day in interesting ways. Uh, a lot of the world building I do is very compact and kind of leans on impressionistic evocative phrases rather than uh, of sprawling uh, stacks of books. Mm -hmm. And I want to ask how you take inspiration from the real world without perhaps falling on stereotypical ideas or ways of thinking. Uh, and also, whether you can use anything in the real world to kind of explore some idea in your game that is, maybe you want to explore some issue or think about something, and whether that ever plays a role at all in some of the worlds that you build. So kind of a two-parter there. Sorry about that. <laughs> yeah, I, I would say absolutely. Um, for me, and I'm sure w with uh, my fellow game designers, everything gives me ideas. Uh, I draw ideas from, from, from nature, from science, from technology, from movies, comic books, novels, you know, everything. Uh, I, I sometimes joke and say, yeah, it's, you know, steal the best ideas from everybody, you know, and then make them yours. Um, and as far as uh, themes, absolutely. You know, it, it's like one of the running themes in, in our Rifts game is... Uh, you know, that everyone has value. Because uh, in Rifts, there's what we call DBs, dimensional beings, uh, aliens who have been swept through the Rifts into, onto Rifts Earth, where they have to adjust and survive against, you know, human supremacists 
who think anything non-human must be destroyed. Uh, and there's a lot of fear based on, you know, magic and things that people don't understand. And so one of the, one of the themes that kind of runs throughout that, that game world is, you know, people finding acceptance and, and, you know, facing the opposition of people who want to destroy you just because you're, you're different. But, you know, there's a lot of other themes, you know, like, like Ninja Turtles is more about family and our other games are, you know, because we do everything. So, you know, our horror game, it's, it's, you know, what would you do if you had superpowers or had to fight demons and you're the only ones who could recognize them, you know, that kind of thing. It's just, you know, no matter what and no matter what kind of themes you bring in, these are games. So we always want to make sure they're fun. Um, so, you know, that's always an element as well. Yeah, I mean, I definitely think you can draw uh, inspiration from just about anything. Um, so you're naturally bound to uh, draw inspiration from the things you're exposed to. Um, and so, you well, know. And, and, the th not, no, but, and the things that you love. Yeah. You know, that's, you know, for any of you who are game designers or even just game masters who want to create your own worlds, draw on the stuff that excites you. Draw on the stuff that... Um, you love that that you find exciting because that love and excitement will come through in your games. Yeah, and, and so like sometimes the the worlds that I create, I can, can some kind of contrast with like this the standard sort of D and D type settings that everyone, uh, well, most folks are familiar with. Um, and so uh, you know, I'm I'm interested in sort of different stories, uh, and so you know. I grew up in this area. We have a lot of natural beauty, I think. Um, so the sort of beauty that maybe not everyone appreciates. Uh, we have a lot of swamp land down here in South, Southeast Michigan. Um, for me growing up, that, that was heaven, you know, and all the life that's in there. And so, um, you know, that, that's like a key touchstone in most of my work. Because of that, that natural uh, sort of touchstone is, is there. there, there winds up being a friction between the natural world and civilization. So, uh, for example, I have a, a, a project called Worldlings, uh, and it's these little spirits that uh, sort of give uh, life to the natural world. And the, the whole conflict of that book is these naturalistic spirits that are uh, being uh, butted up against by spreading civilization and you know civilization pushes on them and they kind of push back and so it, uh, the, you start like taking these themes in uh, or these these inspirations in and they they can turn into uh, I think kind of more profound themes uh, just by thinking about how the real world the real inspiration um, you know, what's happening in, the, in those environments, if that makes sense. Yeah, I, I like that you both talked about distilling themes from the media we love. And I think that um, the reason I love focusing on that is because at the end of the day, these are worlds that we're creating for play. It's so that people can sit down and engage with these worlds in a way that leads to them telling cool stories. And so, like, prioritizing, like, verisimitude or historical, like, lin like, like those those kinds of those kinds of things, where we try and make the most coherent setting, aren't actually what's important at the mm -hmm. at the table. What's important at the table is that people can look at one of your you know source books or whatever it is and say like, I know what to do with this. And so making worlds that you can do something with, I think, is really important. And so yeah, I, I like that you both kind of zeroed in on finding the themes in what you love and turn, putting them into a package that people can actually engage with and play with and do something with at the table. And something I think you said earlier was, uh, and you hinted at here too, which is there's gaps. And you leave the gaps so that people can fill them in. And the, it's almost like those gaps are the most evocative part of, uh, of building a world. So. Yeah, I mean, I think that it's really interesting sitting next to the two of you, because Jim, you've designed games that are like 30 pages long, and Kevin, you've designed games that are like 30 books long. <laughs> <laughs> And there's kind of like these two contrasting ways of approaching things, right? There's like infinite depth or there's like impressionistic depth, right? Where you like provide a lot of interesting chewy details about something. 
and then you leave a lot of open space for people to design around. But even when you have those, you know, Rifts is a game that is about this tall. If you stack all the books together, I'm sure. <laughs> uh, even still, then there's there's so many blank spaces that players inevitably still find to fill in and make their own. Well, because we're trying to inspire our audience, we're trying to give them material. They go, "Wow, this is cool. I want to play this cool character or that character, whether it's a dragon or a cyborg or a wizard or whatever the heck it is, in this very interesting world." And you want them to take. When you design games, you want them to take your foundation and your world and make it theirs. So you need those gaps um, so that they have places they can go and where they can build on things that you've given them so that they can truly make it theirs. Because that's the fun experience, especially of role-playing games, is that it, it's like your memory of a role-playing game after you're done playing is like having seen a great movie. But the really cool thing is, you were the main characters. Your decision to do this caused this. You know, your decision to do that saved, you know, this innocent, you know, non-player character. But you, in your mind, it's like this cinematic thing. Yeah, it feels very and, real. And, and you're the heroes, you know? And it's, it's, it's just awesome. And that's why people get so passionate about it and love playing them so much. I just want to tell people that if you have a question, you can raise your hand, and I'll be around to uh, pass the mic to you. But let me ask, how much do you worry about internal consistency? We are playing a game, but I don't know if internal consistency gets in the way of either your world building or perhaps the player's enjoyment of that world. Does it play a role at all for you? Maybe you go first. I mean, I a minute ago said that I feel like internal consistency is less important than players being able to look at the world you've created and uh, feel inspired to do something with it. Right. Um, and uh, that's my answer. Yeah. If, it, if it's not uh, internally consistent but no one notices, then it doesn't matter. <laughs> 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 but, I, I mean, love you, that answer. <laughs> you, you want to, like... Mm, you want to set things up so that it feels real. And so, you know, obviously, like, having some sort of internal logic uh, helps with that. Um, but, you know, uh, what was it one of the, the horses in Game of Thrones, and the first book was male, and then the, the last book was, was uh, female, and the author totally forgot, and nobody really noticed, you know, except for one super fan. And so, like... Uh, you don't always need to have all that detail consistent all the time. And maybe I just want to also add, like, when we're talking about stories, internal consistency is also sometimes, like, not about uh, logical real-world consistency, but about, like, genre consistency, right? Um, in Twilight, uh, the great cinematic masterpiece of our time, Twilight, um, when Edward Cullen walks into the classroom for the first time, uh, and our main character sees him, his hair is blowing in the wind um, in like an indoor space. That is really consistent with paranormal romance. It doesn't make any sense in if someone's like trying to plot out, where is the wind coming from? But it, but it makes a lot of sense in terms of like, what is it like to experience this glorious vampiric boy for the first time? It makes a ton of genre consistency. And that's a type of consistency that actually leads to like compelling... Uh, engrossing stories more so than like the physics working. I actually have a kind of a fun comment involved because I have a problem involving co internal consistency. My uh, my game, uh, my uh, Vampire the Masquerade game, uh, my vampires are about to go on a road trip to Chicago. <laughs> problem is I don't know Chicago that well, and yeah, there's the Chicago by Night book to help me, but I got. Uh, I also have uh, one of the people lives in Chicago, so I'm like constantly like, oh God, am I gonna have a building wrong or a street wrong or <laughs> something and he's gonna call me out on it. So I got this little bit of anxiety about consistency going on in my head, uh, especially as they're like, come on, aren't we gonna start our next sessions? And I'm like, I got a lot of things to work on. <laughs> I, I think don't don't overthink it, especially for your own game. If they're having fun, they're going to forgive you if you have something on Michigan Avenue that doesn't actually belong on <laughs> Michigan Avenue, um, you know. And then you know, you know, thankfully these days you can just Google, you know, maps and places and. 
There you go. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and, you know, and, and, and if they call you on something, you always say, hey, you know, it's not our Earth. It's an alternate mm -hmm. Earth, you know, because we don't have real vampires, well, that we know of. Um, <laughs> I think there's, there's also the, op, like, option of just turning to the person. If you have one player at your table who actually em. knows what Chicago, yeah, <laughs> oh. well, there's that, <laughs> who actually knows what Chicago is like, um, just mm -hmm. defer to them. Uh, frequently, that's a thing you can do, kind of with anyone, even in a fantastical yep. setting. The Mountain Witch uh, was a role-playing game that that utilized this technique really heavily, and so I first learned about it as the Mountain Witch trick. But you can just uh, be like, and then we're in like a really like grimy, ugly part of town. We're on a street called, and then just like point to your Chicago expert, and they can tell you this street. And um, anything that they say is just is true it's and canon. canon, right? And so that that way they get to feel excited about knowing more than you do about Chicago instead of feeling judgmental about it. And also remember, Chicago's a big frickin' city. They're not gonna know every street, every corner, every, you know, business, so you're, you're pretty safe. Well, you do bring up an interesting thing because, sorry, I didn't silent my phone. I'm trying to do that now. Um, you know, when we're designing games, at least when I'm designing games, I'm sure if these folks as well, um, research, you'd be amazed at the amount of research that goes into a fictional or fantasy game. Um, I mean, when I did Beyond the Supernatural, uh, I read like 400 books on various supernatural phenomenon and the paranormal and monsters and myths and legends. And the guy who actually came up with the idea and did the first draft of the book, Randy McCall, he's a maniac. He read like a thousand books. Uh, Eric Woodrick, when he wrote uh, Ninjas and Super Spies, read like a thousand books. Um, it's crazy the amount of research that can go into uh, a game. But the real thing, the real trick for the game designer is whether it's real or imagined, is to make it feel authentic, to make it feel plausible. So I, I love when people come up to me and say, man, I love your games because they're so realistic. Mm -hmm. And I want to laugh because there's nothing realistic about it at all. You know, you're battling demons or monsters or dragons <laughs> or God knows what, aliens from another world. But I say thank you, and I'm proud of that because what they're really saying is, man, I really can delve into your world, and it feels real. I feel like I'm really there. And that's what we're all trying to accomplish. Jason Morningstar has designed a number of historical role-playing games, and I, th I remember in one of his texts, he, he you know, he says like, you know, like I put all this work into like sh sharing this moment in history, this very specific, well-researched moment, and he knows a ton about it. But like, ultimately, when people sit down at a table, like they're gonna get it wrong, and that's fine. Yep. Um, you can't play a historical role-playing game if you're afraid of the fact that you don't know everything about history, no one does, right? You're, you're gonna tell a story and it's gonna, it's gonna be close to, but also divergent over and over again from what that real situation was. And so just embracing that and naming it to your group, I think is also really great. Just saying like, like Kevin said, like this is not necessarily our Chicago. We're gonna, we're gonna try and get it to feel like our Chicago, but all the details are gonna be a little bit off and that's fine. And if people buy in that it's fine, then it's fine. I think I saw a hand here. Yeah. Here, let me bring this up. I'll tell you about. So, yep, that's a good volume. Um, is this this answer of let's make it genre consistent. Let's um, make it feel to our players, you know, real. I, it's, it's an answer I hear a lot, and. An answer, uh, a question I often am left with is, how, how do I as one person get an idea of what other people think of a genre without you know, having my own day job uh, reading 100 books <laughs> on the particular genre? Um, yeah, it's, it's how, where do you look to find someone who's already distilled that or um, someone who's put together some kind of format of thinking about these things to try to um, make that process a little bit easier. Well, I, I think that there's like a 
degree of shared culture that uh, you can tap into. Um, I mean, uh, the, the the kids on bikes genre is a good example of this. I mean, any of any of these genre games really, uh, where you have been exposed to stories, media throughout your your life, and uh, you know other people have been exposed in similar ways. And if you watch a you know a thousand kids on bikes movies. Uh, you're you're gonna have a pretty similar impression to someone who just watched ET for the first time. You know, um, it, it, it'll it'll vibe. Well, also along those lines, if you watch like maybe the best three or five movies or uh, on kids on bikes or zombies or whatever, you're gonna get a pretty rock solid feel. Uh, I think a lot of it really depends on what you're doing it for. If you're doing it for your game. You know, do what works for you, whether it's listening to a couple audio books or, uh, you know, watching some TV shows or some movies in that genre. Uh, you know, if you're designing a game for, you know, mass public consumption, then, yeah, you're going to have to do a lot more homework. So I, I will just add, uh, apologies, that uh, it doesn't need to be exact. It doesn't have to be exactly what, you know, the, the cultural, like, boiled down version of such and such a thing is. Like you can make something new at the table that is uh, inspired by and yep. different from all that stuff. So, I don't know, trust your players and work together on it. I mean, Kevin's team read 400 to 1,000 books <laughs> for each of their games. So hopefully, I mean, if they've done their job well, their game reflects all of that research. They've done yep. it for you and they've turned it into something usable at the table. Yep. And so hopefully the game mechanics and all of the text um, supports you so that if you're just engaging with the game, you're just playing the game, you will naturally, by virtue of how the game works, produce the kinds of stories you're seeking to produce. So that's, that's part of it. I think also a, a big thing, in my opinion, is that um, when you're sitting down with a group of people, you can just uh, spoil the metaphor. You can just tell everyone the secrets and uh, reveal the, the nature of the metaphor, and you can just spell it out for people, um, and it doesn't ruin anything. I think people are often really afraid of like, oh, we're gonna like spoil it, or like it's gonna lose all of its like impact if we kind of name it. Um, I know that earlier in the day there was um, a how to, uh, how to run a campaign like a pro panel here, and they were talking a bunch about the, the Aliens RPG. Um, and if someone's like, well, I've never played, I've never watched Aliens or any of the Alien movies, and I don't know anything about that, that world building, you can just sit down with them and say, listen, the monsters are representations yep. of our latent psychosexual dread. <laughs> and it's that way because H.R. Geiger was weird. And then they can be like, cool, I get it. Right? It's like, it doesn't actually take that much. You don't need to ex explain all the biology of xenomorphs. Just that sentence alone, they'll either be sold or not sold, and they'll get it. <laughs> Well, and, and I agree with Avery completely where, yes, it's, it's the book sets it up. You don't need to know aliens or whatever the subject is. You don't have to have seen Game of Thrones or, or Lord of the Rings or read those books to appreciate and enjoy a fantasy setting. You know, you're going to get it. It's all there already. So, yeah, definitely don't, don't overthink it. And that, that does kind of bring up an interesting thing with, like, how game mechanics build that mood. And so, I mean, yep. talking about Alien, and then that makes me think of Mothership, and so there's all these uh, mechanics built around increasing the tension, just like in uh, yep. like an Alien movie sort of thing. And so I think it's really, it's interesting. I don't know. So we've got a question here, and I think there and there. Okay. So if you're starting out in your own sort of world-building scenario, you know, um, maybe I've chosen Rifts, or maybe I've chosen D&D, &D, and I've, so I've got a basic medieval setting. But as I build my world, you know, for the first session, I know there's a village, and I know it's got a tavern because they've got to meet there. <laughs> but I don't know the rest of the world. How much do I need to know to get started, you know, to get started having, the, and there's a dungeon somewhere. That's all I know. <laughs> I, I think whatever makes you feel comfortable. You know, like this young lady was worried about you know, I don't know Chicago. I got to learn everything about Chicago, and you don't. 
You just need to feel comfortable with what you do know. Same thing with you. You just need to know uh, and be willing to uh, improvise. And, you know, so one of the great things about role playing, I think, is you, it, it's just like actors. You always hear actors say, you know, the biggest thing about acting is to listen, to listen to the person you're, you're interacting with in that scene. Same thing, listen to your players. They'll give you ideas, they'll give you leads. My guys in my, in my fantasy game, my original Defiler campaign, you know, when a new guy came in and would say, gosh, I hope we don't run into witches or vampires, you know, the rest of the group at the minute says, I hope we don't, they'd be like, no, don't say it, oh. Because then I'm going to introduce witches or vampires or both. And, you know, so play off your, your players, uh, trust yourself, and just be ready to improvise. In fact, a great example of that is I was playing this epic dungeon, the, the Plane of Desire, it was a mix, it was kind of a predecessor to Rift, so it had a mix of magic and technology and you know, dimensional stuff. And, and I had, the guys wanted to face vampires. So I, my most elaborate level in my dungeon, the biggest thing I ever created was level four, the vampire kingdoms. And there was actually an elevator because it was a mix of magic and technology. And they're about to hit the elevator to go to level four. And one of those guys are like, you know, we're always going down into the dungeon. <laughs> What's around the world? Like you, I have no flipping idea. <laughs> there, there, there's, a, there's a town, there's these levels, I know everything in the Palladium of Desires. And then another player goes, yeah, maybe we should go exploring. And I'm like, okay, guys, level four, vampires, <laughs> let's go. And they're like, and then another one goes, yeah, let, maybe we should just go exploring today. And I'm like, oh, now they're just messing with I you. get not, no, and in, the whole freaking group, we're talking 26 guys. They used to play of 26 players. Wow. <laughs> they're all like, yeah, let's go exploring into the real world. And I'm like, oh my God. <laughs> and, and I had to wing everything and it was great. And they had a blast. Um, so, you know, trust yourself, trust your storytelling and trust your players, you know, feed off of what they're saying and doing. And then just have fun with it. You know, don't, again, don't overthink it. It's a game. Have fun. And yes, you're a game master, so you have to, you have more responsibility than actual players, no matter how, whether it's three of them or 26 maniacs. Um, you know, just have fun with it. And you know, especially if you know your players, especially in a smaller group where, you know, it's three, four, six, eight players, they're probably your friends. They're probably people you know. You know what they like. You know what they're going to find fun and exciting. Introduce it in your game. It'll be fine. Sorry, I got kind of long. No, no, I think that's great. I think you, you really um, hit on, uh, I think, the biggest trap in world building, especially world building for a campaign that you're going to run for people, which it sounds like is the kind we're talking about here. Um, the biggest trap is to try and detail out every single thing that could happen and, in the process, become really attached to what you've created. If you write a thousand pages of backstory, about four of them will become relevant during play. <laughs> yep. yeah. And if and, it, and if it, and if that exchange yep. rate is worth it for you, rad. Write a thousand pages. <laughs> yep. um, but it's it's quite likely that if you even if you create this elaborate ten story dungeon, someone's gonna be like, wait, if I combine this spell with this spell, can't I just melt through the floor? And in that way, couldn't I just <laughs> skip directly to the bottom layer of the dungeon? And you'd have to be like, well, I guess technically. <laughs> technically. And so then, then floors one through nine, they're not relevant. <laughs> More, right? Like even yep. in the most linear possible story, uh, they're going to surprise you and they're going to do other things. So I think that um, it's important that the game supports you in improvising and that the material that you create is stuff that you're likely to use and creating it on the, on the fly or uh, just in time, like one session ahead of time, is often the best way to make sure that like your world building actually uh, reaches the table and actually comes up in the story. Because until it's told in the story, it's not relevant. You can also create places for the, the players to contribute. And so, you know, if they, if you have this one town, uh, you could ask the players, all right, what is your relationship to this town? Um, where did you come from? And uh, you can actually, like, together build out more and more of the world, start simple, and then you just kind of add these layers until you get something after, you know, 40 years of playing or something like that that is, like, uh, a thousand pages. <laughs> so, um, not that I know anything about playing that long. So. <laughs> I think if, if you trust your resources and you trust your improvisation and you trust your players, then 
all you need is like a few sentences to go. You mm-hmm. can be like, hey, we're on an international space station, but it's a giant mushroom, and the vibe is prog rock. Are we good? <laughs> if you're good, then that's all you need. You don't need to prep more. You can just make it up, right? Yep. As long as the tools support you and it's not exhausting to do so. Right. And that's the thing about going too deep uh, early on is like you, you, you can like you can spend years building a world uh, and, and not playing at all. And that, that's a game in itself, but uh, you don't need to do all that. Well, and don't be too attached. There's an old saying about you got to, as a writer, game designer, you got to be willing to kill your babies. Mm-hmm. So if you're on, your players are, you know, you have something set up, and in your mind, this was going to be the greatest adventure the world has ever seen, but in reality, it's garbage. They're bored, they're not having fun. Switch up, just get rid of it, throw it out the window and run with something that you know will be more fun, more interesting. That applies to whether it's game design or whether you're running an adventure. Or living life. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Well, the thing I was going to ask about has just been covered entirely. So (laughs) I think I'm just going to agree and say that the greatest pleasure in game mastering is definitely the sheer unadulterated joy of creating as you just go by. Mm -hmm. Well, and personally, as a game master, I love it when my players surprise me. You know, because in my mind, I'm kind of figuring out where this is probably going to go. And then when they they give me that, you know, curveball, I'm thrilled, you know. That's fun. Um, uh, Do you have any um, insights or even just interesting stories about how you've been building worlds had ideas that inspired mechanics to then interact with those pieces of world? Like, I'm thinking of examples of you think of a cool character, but you're like, okay, what is that character actually going to do? Like, just any interesting lore mechanic relationships that you've had in your time as the game I think that's a great question. I want to hear what you guys say first. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, (laughs) I'll talk about it, yeah. Um, I mean... Let's take, for example, magic. Uh, now, you can just say magic exists. All right, well, has magic always existed? Do, do people fear magic? Uh, and so um, you, you have this like mechanic, and it impacts the world. I think what you're saying, though, is how does the world impact, impact mechanics? Um, and... I'm trying to think of some examples of that. I don't know. You got some? Yeah. Uh, so I think often game designers um, uh, historically have been attached to the idea of, of building rules that uh, cover everything that people might do. Um, there, was, there was a joke a while ago that a role-playing game uh, needed rules for drowning and falling. Um, there's a role-playing game called Drowning and Falling that someone made as a, as a result, which is just only rules for drowning and falling. Um, uh, <laughs> But role-playing games just need um, rules that, um, that are going to be meaningful to engage with um, for exploring certain themes or certain story arcs or certain genres. And, um, and we, you don't actually need r- rules that cover everything the character can do. Uh, you need rules that introduce interesting constraints that people have to struggle to overcome because that's where interesting drama comes from. And it's the stuff that's really exhausting for players to have to invent on their own, right? And so you really want rules that are going to introduce interesting, thematically relevant barriers. And so I think a lot of the best rules in any given system are, are usually tied to like a weird setting constraint, um, right? Like the, the counting the number of moons since you last count, cast a spell, because that's how it works in this world. And so, yeah, I think, I think interesting rule building and interesting world building are often intertwined because the world building is only relevant in so much as it impacts play and the rules are only interesting in so much as they impact play. And so I think when they're interwoven, you get some really bizarre, compelling stuff. Yeah, I think there's actually a lot you have to think about. Um, We have a saying at Palladium that role-playing games is rocket science because there's so much to them and so many things you have to think about. And our approach is we want a lot of the mechanics to be invisible. We want you to be focused on your character, on the story, on the setting. And so the way we approach it is what is the story? 
what is the setting, what are we trying to convey, and most importantly, what's going to be fun for the players. So if we come up with a mechanic that you know might be super clever and never been done before, but it plays like crap, again, out that window with that baby, because you know it doesn't work. It's too slow. It's a problem. Uh, I have a guy, uh, Sean will kill me for saying this because it's top secret, but we got a guy who's <laughs> working on a cyberpunk game for us. We Palladium has never released a cyberpunk game, and this guy really wants it. And he has, he outlined the whole world, and it was very cool. He had a lot of great ideas. It definitely has that, that feel of cyberpunk. But we look at it, at his outline, and we're like, but what is the player's motivation? What's fun for the players? What makes, so it's an interesting world, but okay, I'm a player, what do I do? do in this world? What, what makes, who's the bad guy? Who, who, what am I fighting? What am I, you know, trying to save or do or, and it was all missing. And he just kind of missed it because he was so caught up into what's in the world. It's like, that's great. But now our players, they have to be in this world and it's all about the players and the adventures they're going to go on. Um, and so, you know, you need to think about that and then how do the game and mechanics actually work best to fit into that world, to be fun for the players? Um, you know, what are the consequences? There just there's a lot of little elements to it. But yeah, for, for us, it's like sort of, this is what we want to convey, what now? I mean, a great example too is Pinnacle Games um, with their Savage Rules system. They want things to be very cinematic, and so they wanted things to be very fast, and their rules reflects that. You know, Palladium Books, we want that too, but our focus is on character and story. So people will go, oh my God, the Palladium lore is amazing. It's the best in the business. And I'm like, thanks. <laughs> um, you know, and some people don't think our mechanics are quite as good as some others, or they're a little old and need to be updated, and I agree. Um, but, you know, it's like, what's your focus? What are you trying to convey, um, both for your audience and as the game designers? You know, and... Again, that's why it's rocket science, because there's so many different elements you have to think about um, to, to create a, a really good game, a really fun world. Uh, I, and, and you started to mention it. it, it uh, when I was in uh, high school, I, I, I took a, um, uh, um, a, a, a class about writing for newspapers. And, you know, it's the classic, you know, for them, it, it's like who, what, when, where, you know. And, and that's what you do when, with game design. You know, if you create a creature, um, you know, I had a guy who was like, uh, had this weird creature that had like tentacles and whatever and, and blah, blah, blah. And, and it's like and it eight legs. And, and I'm reading this thing and I'm like, so I'm, right away I'm thinking if it's got tentacles, it must be aquatic. You know, if it's got eight legs... You know, and he called it an arachnoid something. So I'm thinking, well, that's where the eight legs come in. But it wasn't aquatic. It wasn't even an animal. It was a freaking plant. Why are we calling it an arachnid anything? Make it have sense. He just, he just threw in a bunch of things that would be weird and interesting, except it wasn't because it made no sense. And it's like, think about it. If the creature has big eyes, does that mean it's, it's, it's nocturnal? Probably. Um, those are all the kind of elements you need to ask yourself when you're designing these things. Something else that comes to mind uh, as the two of you have been talking has been uh, for like adventure design. Um, there, a lot of times adventures have like a mechanical element that uh, adds some sort of dimension to the play. So a uh, ticking clock. Uh, when you don't have time, it adds tension, it makes things fun. All right. so what causes the, the clock to tick. That exists in your storytelling. That exists in your world building. Um, so maybe it's uh, the sun is getting closer to the earth. Or um, I don't know, like a, there's a, a Brad Kerr adventure where the sun is stuck in the sky. Um, and it, it creates a pressure in the, in the game that is exciting. You feel it. And uh, so it's a mechanical benefit from, and you have to explain it within the story. So, I don't know. 
A game that had a really profound impact on me as a player and a designer was Apocalypse World by Vincent and McGay Baker. And uh, in that game, uh, it's it's a world that's gone through the apocalypse. It's a post-apocalyptic world. It's called Apocalypse World. <laughs> and um, in, in that game, everyone has a playbook, which functions very similar to a class um, in D&D, right? But you've, you've got, like, you're the driver or you're the maestro of the town or you, w whatever the case might be. Um, and characters have moves, which are actions they can take in the world. And what I think makes uh, a really good playbook in Apocalypse World or in any of the games that have been inspired by its system, powered by the Apocalypse games, is that the moves in a playbook function together to create a kind of an economy or like a subsystem, a little mini game that this one person is playing. Um, and I think that's a really good example of uh, rules uh, reflecting the lore, not just of like, um, of, of a world, but of like, what does it mean to be a driver in this mm -hmm. world? In, in, a, in a world where, you know, civilization has collapsed, what does it mean to be the one person who can get in their car and go and leave forever when no one else can? Um, and I think that like when, when a playbook is well designed, it's well designed because all those moves create an economy of action. They create like a, a feedback loop where you're not just taking actions that are like, oh, I did this action and then this action and then this action. They're bigger than the sum of their parts and they work together to create interesting dynamics that drive a story across a whole session or across multiple sessions. And I think that's kind of like what you're talking about as well. The like, that, that's an example of rules, um, uh, kind of bringing a setting to life but within the context of a specific archetype of like how, I mean, how it is to be in that world. Well, and it's how each character class, or whatever you want to call them, is unique unto itself. Because that's going to be fun. And that's going to appeal to the guy, uh, to the player who wants to play a driver for whatever reason, or wants to be the warrior, or wants to be the healer. Um, you make them different enough where they feel unique. Everyone wants to feel special, and that, that applies to your game. You want to be the hero. You want to be like, like any player character in any role-playing game. They're not Joe Average. They're someone special for some reason, whether it's training, whether it's a superpower, whether it's a psychic ability, whether it's magic, um, whether it's their courage. Um, they want that. They want to have that, that specialness that makes them and their character unique in that unique world setting. Yeah, yeah then you can provide opportunities mechanically to like leverage yep. that. So like in Beetle Knight, if you, you have like a background that, that you can roll for and then if you can describe to the Arbiter how you would use that background to gain uh, some sort of advantage in a situation, then there's a mechanical like benefit to it. And so it builds out your world by saying, oh yeah, so I was a fungal farmer, so I know all about uh, these weird spores. And so it's like, all right, all right, great, sure, you can promote your die for this role. So, um, yeah. Yeah, the best world building for games is the world building that is usable by players at the table. And the best way to make it usable by players at the table is to give it mechanical expression, right? Something that they can point to and say, I do that. Mm -hmm. um, that's how you make a, a world come to life in a game. And then for the game masters out there, you want to try to make sure you give each of your players their moment to shine. So you want to give that mushroom expert <laughs> their chance to go, hey, this fungus is, you know, otherworldly, or this, this has healing properties, or whatever it is, they have their moment to do something that they can sit back later and go, well, in the game, I figured out, you know, this or that, or I did X, Y, and Z, because um, that's what it's all about, the player's involvement and them having fun. Or even letting the player tell you <laughs> what it, uh, oh, what absolutely. that weird fungus yes. is. Yeah, so. I see you. the microphone. Yeah, you guys actually just answered or had a couple ideas that are relevant to this question, but um, there's such a continuum of role-playing games from in terms of world-building where the designer has pre-sculpted a world for you all the way down to games, I, I think of like The Quiet Year or Dialect, games like that, where the world-building is incumbent on the players in, in a major way. Thinking about that part of the continuum, I've, I've encountered situations where it's challenging for the players to come up with things on the spot or their, their visions for the world clash. 
And so I'm just wondering if there are tools that you all have in your toolkits as designers or you've seen games that, that come to mind where the designer has put in place mechanics to facilitate that world building on the part of the players to make that easier or to help mitigate some of the tensions or to maybe, I don't know, maybe to actually build on the tension to make something happen. Um, because I find that part of the of role playing games very inspiring, but I also find it really challenging sometimes, and especially when the folks on the table may have different experiences with it or different comfort levels with it. Um, yeah, so I, I can talk about how I've approached um, kind of getting on the same page um, in one of the games that I wrote. I wrote a game called Dream Askew. It is a uh, game about being in a queer community um, amidst the collapse of civilization. And um, part of, there, there's a lot uh, that is specific about the world building, um, but there's also a lot that's really kind of impressionistic, where it's like you're choosing an evocative phrase off of a list, and what does that mean? Well, that's kind of up to you. Um, but one of the things that, there's, there's a couple pieces to getting people on the same page in terms of world building. Uh, the first is that you, every, it's a GM-less game, and so everyone uh, shares authorship of the world. And part of the way that we do that is we have setting elements. So one, of, one player is gonna end up being in control of and playing as the intact society, like the gated communities and the privileged and wealthy people who are still you know, in a functional society. And someone else is gonna be the outlying gangs who are off you know, on their motorbikes in the wastelands. And so in addition to playing their characters, everyone has like a setting element that they're, they're kind of, they're running. That's their like mini GMing lens. Um, and all of those are, pr are partially predefined. They've got you know, a, a couple paragraphs of text that gets read aloud that defines like, here's what, it, here's what the society intact is all about. But then that player will um, pick a few things off of a list to further define it. Like, here's what they want. They want uh, ignorance of outsiders. They want a technological solution to every problem. They want whatever the case might be. Um, the outlying gangs, they might want fealty and mutant blood, or they might just want a, a home-cooked meal. Um, and so uh, everyone gets to customize the setting elements, which helps both um, create buy-in, and, um, and it also um, signals to one another, like, hey, this is the kind of world that I'm interested in exploring. Uh, and then similarly, they in, in creating, like, where is our community? Um, there's a, a long list of possible visual elements, and everyone picks one of them off of the list um, to say, like, our community has uh, wet tarps everywhere, or our community has um, an abandoned train station, um, which is partially just giving evocative details about the setting, but it's also kind of trying to collaboratively create a vibe and a shared buy-in for that vibe, so that when you start telling stories, everyone feels like they're already invested and they have... Um, and they have an idea of what the world around them is gonna be like. So that's one strategy that I've utilized for creating that sense of being on the same page and feeling invested in it. Yeah, and uh, I, I've done something similar. I certainly didn't come up with this idea, uh, but I have a collaborative world building sort of session uh, when you're getting started. And so, um, I got a little free PDF you can uh, download that has a few prompts, but you don't you don't need that. You can just like take a, a a blank hex map, and then say, "All right, tell me what was here uh, long ago," and everyone will pick a hex and write something that was there long ago, and you all kind of talk about it. Uh, all right, what was something uh, like some huge change that happened? Uh, in each of these places. And then you go and you pass it around and you say one huge thing that, that had changed in all those places. And so uh, this collaborative world building uh, sort of session is a time when you, ju you just spend it getting on the same page, uh, getting on the same page. And it can be crazy. Like these, the worlds can be absurd. Uh, one, <laughs> uh, one world that we, I created this way with some friends was you're on top of the, the, the back of a giant baby, but it's the size of a, a continent. And then everyone is little bugs, and uh, everyone eats sugar crystals that are sweated out of the, <laughs> the giant's <laughs> pores, and the, the hairs are trees. So like, all, none of us would have come up with any of that on our own once we started talking through it. We got this really interesting world and had a whole campaign there. So 
I don't know. That's one way. Yeah, I think uh, I think it's an area in role playing that is often overlooked because I think people really focus on on the world and then on on the players. And I think what you're asking is more of as as a game master, if there were ways to implement that more easily. And and I think. Um, at Palladium, we're, we're actually looking at that pretty closely and trying to figure out ways we can mechanize gameplay to, to make it easier with, with very simple rules um, that help the game master feel like he's in more control, has more mastery of the world. Um, and it's tricky. It, it, it's tough because role playing is very personal and we could all play the same game, but our, each of our games is going to be different, maybe even very different. It will depend on the game master and their outlook and what they're trying to do and, and you know, their player group and, and you know, and, and that's also, that's one of the things I love about role playing is that it is very personal. Um, but it, it makes what you're asking kind of tricky. Well, the big thing is, like, just talk about it, you know, talk about it and yeah. resolve it. Uh, through conversation. Yeah. Sure. A related question, I guess, is how do you decide where those kind of productive gaps are where you do leave things to the player's creativity and how do you make that not putting a burden on them but instead like sparking their ideas? There's um, there's a term that came out of uh, the Forge, which is an indie design community uh, that I benefited a lot from its wisdom. And that term was the fruitful void. Um, which is, so uh, at, at the Forge, people talked a lot about the idea that your game is about whatever your mechanics are about. Um, the mechanics should, should point players towards specific types of action, specific types of stories and characters um, and, and uh, plots. Um, but actually, your game isn't about the mechanics, it's about whatever that thing is that all the mechanics point towards and then don't answer for you, right? So if you've, uh, if you've got a game um, uh, that is um, that where you want to explore um, uh, emotional vulnerability between friends, you don't want an emotional vulnerability between friends stat. You want all, the, you want all your rules to point you towards continuously asking, what does it mean to be emotionally vulnerable towards friends? And that's the thing that is really interesting to not answer for your players. So you want, you want interesting answers to the questions that players are, are going to be asking, except for whatever that core tension is that you're most interested in exploring. And that's the thing that you really want to be like, I don't know, figure it out. Yeah, I, I mean, I think you, know, you focus on the big points. and. Uh, you know, the key elements that are important to the world and important to the gameplay and the adventures. And then you kind of leave the rest that can be filled in. Because um, that way, you know, the players, again, each player group's gonna be different. Uh, and you let them kind of go where their leanings are gonna take them. And that's okay because these are just the most sentient points that have to be addressed. Uh, and the rest is all filler. So, you know, one group may really focus on, say, the emotional interaction, while another group might be all about the action. And that's okay, because you've given both enough direction where they can go in either, either way uh, or, or 20 other ways. Um, and and that, I think that, that's sort of the trick. And yeah, figuring that out and doing that, I mean, it just takes a lot of thought and some some practice and experience and the more like anything else the more you do it the better you get if you like try things and they they don't land then you know move on <laughs> but like uh i don't know you, you might be surprised and uh, also given like those cultural touchstones that we were talking about earlier like uh that can provide some guidance to the players so for example uh doing this sort of collaborative world building, uh, but constraining it by we're in 90s suburbia, uh, you know, that, uh, especially folks who grew up here in this area, will have a very strong idea 
and very personal connections are around those details. And so if you prompt them to fill in the blanks there, they're going to know how, you know, they'll, they'll have ideas as to how. But if you are doing the same thing on the back of a, a giant baby, <laughs> there's way less cultural context. And so then uh, the people that you're playing with have to feel very safe with you and they, uh, you have to be like willing to kind of make mistakes and backtrack. And, um, and so it's, it requires like a different sort of like back and forth communication with the players. And I think different players are gonna look for different things uh, and no one game can be right for every player. Some people, they, they just want uh, a little bit of inspiration and then space to talk, right? You, you give them the tiniest morsel of a prompt, and they're, they're good. Uh, and others are really like, it's scary for me to bring my own ideas to the table. I want the safety net. I want the structure. I want the scaffolding of lots of world building or really... Uh, specific mechanics and so the your approach to world building in terms of like four games to create play at the table it it's in terms of like what do you answer and what do you leave blank um, it also partially is just like well what kind of player are you hoping to bring to your table are you hoping yeah. to bring someone who loves pouring over tomes upon tomes of rich backstory or are you looking to bring the kind of player who just wants something, you know, like a light touch that they can make their own. And I think like the three of us have, I think different approaches to world building because in part because we're working with different player groups, right? Mm -hmm. And so some of those player groups are gonna, are gonna want the encyclopedias of compelling, weird, fascinating stuff and others are gonna want the pick list of a couple of evocative phrases. Well, <clears throat> excuse me, unfortunately, we've got to end our session there. Uh, please join me in thanking Avery, Jim, and Kevin. And that's going to end GameCon. So we hope you've had a wonderful day at the library today. <laughs>